uh, me today is to my left, Senator Tommy Morrison, and to his left, Senator Brent McCready. Uh, the purpose of this public hearing is to receive testimony on Bill Number 188-33 COR, uh, introduced by Senator Tony Mor Tommy Morrison, uh, and it's an act to amend um, Section 70, 70108 and 70109.1 of Chapter 70, Division 2, Title 21, Guam Code Annotated, relative to promoting consumer protection by requiring the publication of a contractor's list and by strengthening penalties for unlicensed contractors. And to hear Bill number 191-33 COR introduced by uh, Senator Brant McCready, it's an act to amend subsection A of section 12104, subitem 3 of section 106A, and subsection B of section 12107, each of chapter 12, title 16, Guam Code annotated, relative to towing notice requirements, rate regulation, and liens. Notice of this public hearing was provided to senators, stakeholders, and the local media um, for a five-day notice on October 28, 2015, and a 48-hour notice was provided on November 3rd, 2015 to senators, stakeholders, the local media, and was also published in the Guam Daily Post, thus meeting the requirements of the open government law. This public hearing is also being broadcast on local television and is being recorded, so we ask everyone to speak clearly into the mic and clearly identify yourselves for the record. The committee will continue to receive written testimony until 5 p.m. on Friday, November 13, 2015. Please address testimony to Senator Thomas Ciada, chairperson of the committee. And we'll go ahead now, we'll start with the first bill, and that will be bill number 188-33. And I'll ask the author of the bill to um, introduce uh, the bill. Hafidi, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman Ada, and committee members for scheduling public hearing on bill 188-33. This measure was introduced in an effort to protect consumers from unlicensed contractors. Unfortunately, unlicensed contractors continue to find businesses or business among Guam's families from air conditioning maintenance and repair work, excavation and grading to home renovations. Within the past five years, the Contractors License Board investigated complaints involving unlicensed contractors. In 2011, there were 13 cases involving unlicensed contractors, 42 employees, and a combined project value of $718,800. Or $718,800. In 2012, there were six cases, 26 employees, and a combined project value of $447,200. In 2013, there were nine cases, 34 employees, and a combined project value of $453,300. In 2014, there were seven cases, 36 employees, and a combined project value of $275,500. In 2015, there were five cases, 18 employees, and a combined project value of $131,900. Aside from the estimated $2,026,700 in unlicensed contractors activities within the past five years, it's difficult to forget about the infamous unlicensed contractor who between 2006 and 2010 convinced a number of Guam families, including our Manamku, into paying him more than $140,000 for work that was never performed or was left un incomplete. This individual went to great lengths to avoid facing his victims in court by calling him bomb threats whenever he was scheduled for a court hearing. Just this past month, this particular unlicensed contractor was sent to prison after being convicted of bomb threats 
bomb threat charges. Bill number 188 is a serious effort to protect our families by ensuring that our homes and our structures are built right, that our pe people's hard-earned money are protected, and that illegal contractors are finally put out of business. Regardless of the value of the project involving unlicensed contractors, the safety of our families, including our Manamku, and others who are typically targeted by these scam artists, should be uh, the utmost of concern to us as a community. Bill 188, if enacted, will send a strong message to unlicensed contractors to play by rules, as done by greater numbers of co Guam contractors. Bill 188 recognizes the value of publishing contractors lists for the benefit of consumers who may not be aware if an individual or businesses is a legitimate contractor. Moreover, this measure makes it very clear in law that violators who are to be assessed 50% of the project's value, of which half will be used to provide a level of relief to affected consumers. I look forward to receiving input and recommendations from the members of the public concerning Bill 188. And I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Um, I have signed up here um, Mr. Ronnie Santos, Mr. Ed Ordonez, uh, Mr. Vincent Uggen, and Nita Bailey, I guess all in favor. Uh, but it's not clear who wants, who's going to give oral testimony. Mr. Rigel, did you, were you also going to testify? Just Ed, the director? Okay, so Mr. Uh, Ordonez, are you going to provide testimony? I, I know you, I've received here your, I have received just one written testimony, and that was from uh, the executive director of the Contractors License Board. So did you want to read your testimony? You don't want to read your testimony? Okay. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Senator Ada, uh, Senator Morrison, Senator McGrady, and good morning to everybody. Well, as uh, Senator Morrison uh, read uh, the testimony, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of very close on my testimony. Within past five years, more than $2 million worth of project were carried out by unlicensed contractor. These are individuals and businesses owners who either fail to meet the requirement of contractor license board, or they simply have no regard for the following law. Their decision to perform unlicensed construction result in so many unknown places of safety, the safety of consumers and workers at risk raises a question if businesses withholding and other taxes and peace have been paid and potentially leaves a huge mess for regulatory agency including DPW, Guam Environmental Protection Agency, GPA, Guam Water Works, DRT, GPD and others to clean up after. Moreover, the fact that dozens of construction projects have occurred under the radar this, pa this past five years, with possibly more unaccounted for, is a wrong message we want to give our law-abiding contractors and potential investors. Guam does not condone unlicensed constructors and any effort to address this serious issue must be considered moving forward. <clears throat> Senator Tommy Morrison, the author of Bill number 188-33, believes that this measure is a step forward in Guam efforts to address unlicensed construction, <clears throat> requiring the CLB to publish, to publish a list of licensed contractors at least once annually, or uh, maybe 
add another uh, twice a year, you know, maybe we can bargain on the newspaper because that's too expensive here. But uh, I think it's it's nice to to be published on the newspaper for the to protect our consumer. <coughs> Uh, <clears throat> requiring unlicensed contractors that are fined by the CLB to pay 50% of a project value with the balance of with the balance to be paid as restitution to be affected consumers good standing contractors that follows the law must be supported with a level playing playing field and these who wish to disregard the law should be put out of business. There's a greater number of contractors that play rules. Why, why shouldn't they, this illegal contractor? Thank you very much, uh, Senators. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I also want to recognize the presence of Senator James, Jimmy Spaldon. Thank you, Senator, for joining us. Um, Mr. Dordonis, if you, if you Please just remain. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and open up for questions. Senator Morrison, did you have any questions you wanted to pose? Do, do you have any questions? No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just first off want to thank Mr. Adonis and uh, also the Chairman Reggio is here. I think some of the board members and the staff that are here too as well, and some of the uh, some contractors are here, and I think I mean James Martinez, also representative of the association the contractors. But I, I first off, I, I I don't have a question. I just want to commend the some of the investigators that are here. I know the other ones are also some of the administrative staff that. Uh, with their efforts, we've been trying to work hard to, to bring awareness to our community about how they deal with uh, these contractors. Unfortunately, I uh, pointed out, Mr. Chairman, that uh, it's clear that a lot of our victims here, and you noted here, uh, are, are our elderly. And of course, uh, uh, if, if one step we can take here is expand this awareness with this hearing, uh, is that the folks out there do their due diligence in, in working with the contractors licensing board uh, to ensure that they're working with uh, a contractor that is licensed. But I, I commend the efforts of the investigation unit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Ma, uh, McCready, do you have any questions? Senator Spaldon? Right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, in Section 2, it mandates that the licensing board follows the AAA uh, process when writing rules and regulations. Uh, it also adds a new item C, which defines what a citation shall contain and sets penalties for unlicensed contractors at 50% of the project's value. I guess the question I have is uh, currently, how does the licensing board handle these situations? I mean, these, these are new provisions, but right now, how, how, do, how does it handle the unlicensed contractors? Uh, we, uh, senators, we have a uh, breakdown that was uh, we have followed on on on, the, uh, on our rules. You know, uh, it's stated on the uh, on our rules and regulations. So, if you if you need the uh, like, uh, it's it's kind of hard to to detail completely. Uh, a little but. Uh, Little by little, Senator, so we can we can pass a uh, 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 we can give you a uh, breakdown on that, so that uh, you know you can uh, we can you can you can assess clearly on that uh, how we how we how we charge the uh, the illegal contractor. Uh, I'm not really sure. I'm, I quite follow. Uh, you know, I understand, and I just wanted. Basically, I mean, it doesn't have to be a complicated explanation or anything else. Okay. Bottom line is, if you find an unlicensed contractor, okay. how does the board deal with it? Oh, okay. Uh, uh, the, uh, the board will, uh, they deal it with the, uh, like I said, sir, we have a, uh, we have a standard uh, 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 regulation on that, so. Of course, the their their unlicensed uh, they sh they should uh, they should uh, they should follow what our rules and regulation you know when when we ha when we give them a citation on that. <clears throat> okay. Well, I guess the the maybe a, the initial question should have been, 
if they're unlicensed and if you don't know about them, how do you identify them? Uh, so, uh, okay, Senator, I think I have to give this to my uh, investigator so that and, they can and, and I, yeah, Thank no, you. I appreciate it. Thank just you very much. find out a little yeah. more information. Go ahead, Buenos Senators. Oh, Buenos Senators, thank you for your time. So. My name is Vincent Uggen, and uh, perhaps I may answer your questions uh, to help uh, clear some ways on that. On unlicensed activities, uh, the CLB accepts tips from the public or even uh, the contractors. Uh, when we get a, excuse me for saying all I was just nervous. Is, when we get a, a tip on unlicensed activity, the investigation goes out and where's the PPE, conducts a site investigation, gathers facts, not allegations, but facts, and accumulates so much uh, evidence against him. And he is issued a citation to cease and desist. Okay, and I believe the amount would at that time would was two thousand five hundred. Okay, and then um, he should desist and desist, and then we forward it, we packet it, and we give it to the consumer because we are not into uh, how should I say doing legal things as uh, representing them legally. And I said this may or may not help. You and, and should you go to court to civil matters? It gathers the fact as that infamous uh, one unlicensed contractor. I had to go to court and uh, yeah, I, t I informed them to go to criminal investigation division at GPD, file a police report. I give them all the facts, whatever the system that you know the legal way. And then we went to court, and that one individual that was you know did the bomb threatening, the judge found him for fraud. GPD would uh, go under a theft by deception. But a lot of these individuals that are unlicensed contractors are, you know, it's, it's going out in the field. Is I see it in the Manamku and also these young families that are beginning their life. Their livelihood is spent on entrusting these unlicensed contractors. And not only these unlicensed, are, are not only the victims are the, the public, but also these contractors. These licensed contractors are obeying Public Law 30-11, and they are ensuring that their employees have safety and everything, have workman's compensation, they're paying their taxes. These unlicensed contractors don't care about the p people they employ. So the safety of their welfare, and plus the public that are victimized, are really a very concern. No, and I understand, and I think we all agree with that. Yes, sir. Um, I guess, you know, I just was trying to get down to, right now, the, the proposed uh, okay. the proposed way to handle that is again to uh, basically assess the unlicensed contractors fifty percent of the project's value and I was just wondering how it handles it now so you don't I mean from what you just said uh, the uh, the Guam, Guam contractors licensing board really doesn't bring the case itself or doesn't impose a fine. You just give the investigation report to the homeowner or to whoever the customer no. was, and it's up to them to, to... Sir, we do, by law, the investigators are the only ones at the CLB to issue citations. So there is monetary assess, I believe, at the sum of 2500 Okay. And that's, okay. And, that's what and then the next, should they be caught another violation, it, mm -hmm. I believe it doubles. Okay. But then we forwarded this to the Attorney General's office, and the CLB investigation staff has networked with this, uh, the Attorney General's office, and we accumulated so much facts. Uh, we were just waiting to, to go on that route matter. One uh, person took on the small claims and won the case again. So these are, okay. you know, it's, we do give them a citation that answers your question there. Yes, that actually yeah. that does answer the question. But if I could just ask another one, Mr. Chair. The... Um, there are a lot of little, um, there are a lot of people who work probably for licensed contractors who do side jobs, you know, for minor repairs or, you know, weekend warrior type of projects, right? Do you consider those as potentially unlicensed contractors when they do part-time work, you know, on, on the side? There are a lot of, uh, you could state that, it, that's probably most correct. Okay. They always do the weekend uh, wear thing on just doing it, and we are not, ours is Monday to Friday, excuse me for saying that, but yeah, and they need these home renovations, okay. and sometimes it could go to 7500 It varies on, 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 on out to the public how it is, okay. and how can they justify it? They come out with that uh, 
amount when they're not even licensed. Right. Excuse what it me. could have been cause have. Mr. Chair, if I could clear up uh, Senator Spadon, uh, there, there is a, a, a process also for home improvement. There is a threshold amount too. So, you know, folks that are doing these small types of project, there is a process to, uh, to that uh, regarding a threshold amount. I'm not sure what the threshold amount is now. It could be 2,000 to 500, 3,500. 3, yes, so. so uh, just so yes. to clarify, I mean, now, now that the Senator has kind of put in a little more information, so can I interpret that to mean that these weekend warriors, as long as they do a project that is under that threshold amount, whatever it is, 2,500 or 5,000, they're not really the target of what this bill is concerned with? In uh, other words, you can I go ahead and hire somebody to do. Okay, uh, let me, under Title 21 GCA, uh, Real Property Chapter 70 contractors, 70108 license required. It's uh, even for those weekend warriors, it. regardless if of the amount. If they exceed the amount of two thousand five hundred. Oh, if it exceeds the amount of two thousand five hundred. Okay, okay. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that information. Thank you. Um, I just, I just have a couple of questions. First of all, um, I guess the publication of the list of um, uh, licensed contractors is supposed to be published uh, annually, at least as it's written right now. So I guess probably the best time to uh, put that list together would be sometime in June or whenever it is that one time of the year that um, the licenses are renewed, correct? Uh, so the first question that I have then is, so let's say licenses are renewed in June and I'm a, a new startup company that doesn't finally, you know, finally gets everything together in September. Well, my name is not going to be on that list, but that list is supposed to be something that, you know, as a consumer, I can look at and say, okay, here are all my options, here are all the licensed contractors, but because I did not, you know, file until September, you, you've kind of, in a way, you know, inversely discriminated against me. Uh, Senator, if they are a new applicant, or sometimes they renew uh, later on in a date, it is updated on our website. So they can be inputted into the system of our website should a consumer be looking it up. Okay, so if that's, if that's gonna be the case, we need to put language in here uh, that would ensure that then the contractor's license board uh, is required to make updates, whether it be monthly or whatever. Otherwise, my name is never gonna get on that list um, as, as written right now for at least another 12 months. I, I understand. Perhaps uh, maybe in a timely manner when they're, where they're filing for their, or applying for their uh, licensor. So it has to be done in a timely manner from the administrative staff. But it does get go up. Once we get a new applicant, it could go in within... Okay, it doesn't say that here. All it says is that license board is to publish the list once a year. Yeah. Uh, but there's no mention in here about you know what do you do with the latecomers? Okay, I, so I apologize. Not, 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 not a problem. Not a problem. I just want to point that out. Uh, that's a concern that I have. The other concern that I have is, of course, um, the it would be just as much a disincentive for the company that gets penalized, that gets cited. Uh, so, uh, you know, is there any thought about publishing? Um, here are the list of contractors who, who were found to be in violation of the law. And so, you know, I, I then would take a look at what are my options for licensed contractors and here are the guys that I want to stay away from. Uh, Any thoughts on that, Mr. Ordonez? That's a good one, Senator. So, uh, so at, at at this uh, bill, maybe we can uh, we, we can we can work on it on that one, so that uh, there's no one left behind like what uh, you wanted. So we'll work on that. All right. So I just raised that as a concern, and finally, my final concern is I, I'm not sure I'm clear about. So let's say the investigators go out there 
and they find that in fact there's an unlicensed contractor working on this $70,000 project, right? Uh, the way the law is written here is that the penalty will be the value of that project. 50% uh, will, will go to, um, what is it, 50% goes to, to concept. Wh whatever it is, whatever that value yeah, is. But, but is there a process in the, in the bureau, in the contractor's license uh, a board to at least hear, hear me out? Uh, that maybe what you found uh, is not is not all that it appears to be. Process. A due process, yeah. Yeah. Is there? Yes, sir. There is. Okay, fine. All right. Um, I guess other than that, uh, I, I don't have any other questions. Do you have? May I just ask? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, excuse me for my ignorance. And I, now that I have you here, I might as well find out information from you. If you have the small guys who basically work, we have a lot, well, let me f rephrase this, right? We have some people who, are now, who have been trained through the Guam Academy of uh, Trades, Guam Trades Academy. And again, if I go back to the weekend warrior, the part-time guys, uh, and they may be doing some jobs on the side for a licensed contractor, and then want to also be able to do some jobs, you know, for themselves or by themselves, uh, how difficult is it for these kind of individuals to be able to get a license? And please, yeah, anybody can answer. I'm just trying to get information. Senator, uh, usually when the investigation goes out and conducts the site investigation on the license activity, we not only give them a citation and authority, but we also recommend they come to their office. I mean, everyone wants a piece of the pie. We're not trying to deny it. We're just trying to assist them so they could comply with the law. And everything that, and we give them how to, to uh, we give them a packet to an uh, application to file for that. I mean, we don't want to deny them. We want to give them, but we'd have to do it legally to make sure they do it legally right. to protect everyone. No, and I understand that. I appreciate it. I'm just wondering how difficult it is. To uh, get you, a got, you got some ball players out there, and you got some folks that just don't want to follow law. Well, yeah. it's, not, it's not whether they want to follow the law or not. Sometimes, I guess the question is kind of leading to me to try to understand why some people may not file for a, a license and, and if it's too difficult of a process for somebody who wants to be a weekend warrior uh, then maybe we need to look at that and again I'm not holding anybody at fault or at blame I just need to understand is it difficult for individuals who have the skills and who have the training to be able to get a, a license uh, through the board to do part-time jobs and say they're licensed? We would recommend them to apply for a C30 limited home improvement if they're just starting off. They have to have justification of four years of experience performing the construction work activities. And if they have an educational degree on that trade, which would eliminate three years and it'll go through that process. Okay. Or what they could do is they could hire a, hire a person with it's called a RME, Responsible Management Employee, that has that classification. Okay. That would be the fastest process. They hire them, they get licensed, they are able to perform the job, sir. Okay. Uh, it, and it, and it's really, does it require any kind of testing to get a license? There is testing, sir. And there it's is? currently uh, waiting to be updated. Uh, okay. And, and it's, later. I would imagine, trade-specific on the testing, They're or is it a general type of a, in other words, a say for example. Each trade has a different one okay. uh, to application, and there are study guys, I believe, are, believe that are free, okay. but they must pass the law, and that way there's a fee, the law study guide. They, okay, they, they must have to take, I'm sorry, they must pass the law? They have to pass the law, the CLB law, in order to get their license. And that one, that's the only one that we charge, okay. is the law, but anything else for study guide, study materials, let me right. clarify that. The law is a study, the law guide is a study material. And okay. there's also I for different classifications, work painting, millworks, all kinds. It varies, but there are testings for that. Okay. And, they, you know, if they go through administration to see if they pass it and everything like that, then it's forwarded to the investigation supervisor. He reviews it, and if everything passes there, he schedules an investigation uh, interview. And after the interview, if he passes the interview, it goes to administration, and they schedule a date. And along as uh, all the assessed fees are paid, too, as well. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could just add oh, to that, I, the, the uh, 
at one time Senator Spadon, there, there was a hand, to, to answer your question, how easy that could be or could be done. There, you know, there are a lot of folks that are, are you know, they have this skill and, and they, at one point, DRT handled the, handled the handyman license, which, but had a threshold, I believe, at 1,000. And then the COB uh, uh, were able to increase the threshold at the 2,500. But, but they had a handyman license, so at least these folks were registered at least with revenue tax. But, but revenue tax, I believe, uh, um, uh, suspended that process because of the fact of the, the abuse that they were going beyond the 1,000. You started with a thousand dollar project and ended up a full scale garage, you know. So they were finding out that, you know, that's what was happening. So they were just saying, just basically, you know, if you're you're in, intending to go from a thousand and then this keeps adding up, you know, they just basically were sending them our way, get a license. So the handyman license is no longer available. Uh, Reven tax no uh, does not exist at Reven tax anymore, and CLB doesn't acknowledge it. It's under C30, limited home improvement. Okay, thank you. All right, I want to go ahead and call up also Mr. Frank Paris, a contractor. You signed up. Okay. You may be excused. Mr. Paris. Good morning, senators. Good morning. I'm a contractor here in Guam, and uh, just a. Uh, few issues of what's happening out there. I've been in business maybe um, going on six years. Started out small like you guys were uh, talking about. Problem is I, it, it's pretty hard to compete when uh, things are not being enforced. Uh, I'm in sales as well, as well as the uh, service. But uh, we have issues like the Navy Exchange selling aircon units, go off base and do installation without a contractor's license. When we do work on base, we have to follow by federal laws and rules and whatever base safety. But uh, how can you compete with that outside in our local uh, playing field? I, you know, where do you go? Who, who helps you to try to figure these things out? Uh, I even came into an incident with Reven Tax. Uh, they give a license for AC cleaning. Uh, I pay GRTs for every service I do, right, monthly. I pay my workman's comp insurance. I have uh, liability insurance. I have commercial vehicle insurance. I think almost every insurance they have out there. Thing is, if you give a license out of revenue tax for a skilled work and uh, below, I don't know what the amount is, you don't have to pay GRTs. Uh, is that fair for us contractors? Uh, I went and I asked for a license like that. They didn't want to sign it at uh, Contractors License Board because they don't give licenses like that, but there is licenses that, that do exist. So why can't I have one? Uh, I would like to shift my cleaning services and not have to pay GRTs. Uh, you know, I would like to make more profit that way when anybody would but I think we need more enforcement you know uh, it's nice that you're gonna find the contractors 50% of the project uh, what about the consumers the consumers are the ones that are going in looking for these things why don't you find the consumer as well you're breaking the law uh, they're not paying taxes as well uh, it looks like both both parties are guilty uh, you know, just like my people, sidelines are not allowed. Okay, you represent my company. My, uh, you know, it took a long time to build that reputation, and I just need one problem to ruin it. So, you know, I don't allow that. Second of all, there's no supervision on the job. I shouldn't be responsible for something that they went and did on their own, and I, my insurance will not cover it. Uh, you know. And also the quality of work. Who's gonna Who's gonna ensure that quality of work? Uh, you get a guy who's doing sideline, burn your house down. Where do you go from there? It's, it's safety is first. I mean, you know, laws and everything. No problem. We can change. We can fix. But once somebody gets injured, hurt, death, maybe. What happens there? I go to expos every year to try to improve my trade, improve my company. 
and I tell you, we're 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 pretty behind on a lot of things. Uh, I really think there's a lot of room for improvement, just to make it better for everybody. Uh, you know, I'm local. I'm from here. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, I'm not one of these kind of contractors that you can't get a hold of or run away. So, you know, we just want something done about it. And uh, you know, what 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 more does it take, not to you know, renew my license? Do I just do a sideline so I can be like everybody else and make a pretty penny? So you tell me what, what, what should we do when it's our livelihood and we're struggling, but even the big dogs are doing it too. I mean, I've been in business. Nobody ever came up and asked me for my license. We're issued IDs. Ask me. I, I like that. When you go to the you know the store or restaurant to make a credit card purchase, shouldn't they ask for your ID to verify that it is you? Same thing. But uh, you know, we just want something done. I pay I pay my taxes every year. I'm on time. I pay everything. So I think if that's the case, everybody should. And I think the consumers as well should be liable for for any activity like that. Because you know I I come across it all the time. People call me because oh. This guy we used, can't get a hold of him, it's still broken, what do I do? I said, well, why did you call him? Oh, it's because it's cheaper. It's all about price, but, you know, you get what you pay for. So that's where, that's where we're at. But, you know, I can handle the little guys, but when you got the big guys doing the same thing, what do you do? Do I close up shop? Do I just go quit? sell everything liquidate everything so you know we're just looking for answers us small contractors out there we're, we're, we're here we're, 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 we're gonna be here whatever money we generate goes back into our economy we're not from off island make money send it back somewhere no this is our home so all we're asking is just give us some help I mean you know uh, I was even thinking of making an, an Angie's list for Guam to see who are contractors that are even decent enough to come and do work for your, you know, at your home or business. Because quality, I mean, you can be a licensed contractor, but if you got incidents before in the past, I mean, that makes a big thing. It's just like a police record, right? You know, you ask an employee, can I get a police clearance or whatever? Oh man, you, you got DUI or you got... So that, that, that tells you the quality of that, that contractor. But, you know, where do you, can you give me some answers? What, what do I do? Thank you, Mr. Paris, for sharing your concerns. I, 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 I know the, uh, the first issue you addressed and uh, regarding the issue of the, uh, the annex and the product of selling air cons, right? And you're in the AC industry, right? Right, that's um, correct. Uh, I, I, I'll tell you what's being done, at least from our, our end. We, uh, we are in, in in uh, contact with the admiral right now that is looking into this issue as well and i know understand that uh there are certain I jurisdiction issues actually federal laws that actually allow allow contractors to be exempt uh from obtaining a contractor's license uh doing that they're doing being that they're doing work on military installations uh federal property however uh uh given that we we are trying to address that issue uh i got your information and, and we're looking to that. I know there have been contact with the COB right now. And I think the intent of the law was, of course, they, they are now, uh, things have evolved. I know they're selling AC units and I know the volume that they're selling is pretty high now and, and that, uh, that it's now, uh, uh, of course, when you talked about level playing field, I understand where they're coming from, uh, that they're, they're now uh, not, once they go outside the gate, they should be licensed. So we are in con uh, con contact with the Admiral to see how we can address that. If it needs some, uh, 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 if we need to address our statute to make that clear uh, as well, I'll work with the, the chairman and the committee to ensure that that could be done. Another issue is we'll definitely work with the Reverend Tax and the COB, how we can address those other issues as well. But I know that's a big one because uh, um, I don't think the intent of doing work on base and not being exempt from local requirements. It was an intent actually to go outside and compete uh, and with the other contractors. If that's the case, you know, uh, if you're going to start 
trickling outside and your project starts trickling outside the gate, then you should get a uh, license. So we're making that very clear with the Admiral. Well, it's like a double standard because even a, a landscaping business, you got to go to the contractor's license board, right? Then some guy wants to get a grass cutting business, but then he's doing other stuff other than just cutting grass. So where, where, do, you, where do you draw the fine line? That's, that's, that's the big thing. Because, you know, uh, it's, it's very disheartening to, to be where I'm at, work as hard as we did to get here, and these things are happening. Uh, you know, some of us just want some answers that what, what can be done. Uh, Mr. Perez, you being in the industry and you having those concerns, I guess we could, it would probably be most prudent for us to ask you in the industry what should be done. Enforcement. Enforcement by the contractor's licensing board to be able to get out there and, uh, I guess, inspect everybody. That's right. And all the jobs. So, and we're talking everything from major construction all the way to the landscaping guy that you just talked about. I, I, I believe so. I mean, you know, if, if there's fines imposed, then the fines should go back to the government. And, uh, I mean, if you have to pay a salary of $40,000, get fines back of $500,000, I mean, that's, that's something that's, you know, would be done. Could I get uh, you from the contractors, the board back up here? I mean, just to answer a question. And you've heard the concern, and you've heard the potential one potential solution, you know, and I know that there's only X amount of inspectors to go out there to investigators. Right, investigators. Uh, how many do you have? We have two that are actively out on the field, sir, okay. and we're still waiting for, I think, uh, three more, two more investigators to come along. And you cover everything from the major construction sites all the way down to yes, the small sir. guys? Everything that has to do with construction and that must activity, be very difficult. Sir. How many? How many members within... Uh, oh, how many licensed members are there? Close to 800 to 1,000, I believe, within that, that time frame, within that And that covers state. the full spectrum of, uh, of contractors from the small guys who from do the From a license push. to license, sir. I'm sorry? It covers from a license activity to license contractors. Right. However, um, like there, there's multiple, but like, like we said, we do receive tips. You can receive anonymous. That, that's how we're aware of that. Right. But also, we do have the authority to do by law to investigate uh, site investigations right. there, which allows us to go on uh, where the construction work activity is sure. being performed. But by the, because of the limitation and manpower, you couldn't really address some of the issues that Mr. It Paris can be done, on. sir. It can be done. But I think the weekends would be challenging. Okay. Um, like I said, uh, and I, I like to say thank you, Mr. Paris. For, for being a part of it, investing locally, right. giving back to the publicly. And this is where it is, uh, you know, it's good to hear his opinion. Yes. And we like to assist him more whatever we can legally. And if you have any tips, or if anyone has there out there that are listening, know of construction work activities, please call our office. We will go out. We will go out. But like they say, if you don't know, you can't go. And that's See? And, and like I said, the random site investigations right there. Right. Is where we are. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, you know, I think that the problem is it's not the contracting license board. Okay. They, they probably need more personnel. Right. And, uh, you know, if you want me to pay, I pay $900 a year to them. Uh, if you want me to pay $1,800 a year, I'll pay it. But as long as you can get somebody out there. I, I don't, I, the amount is not the problem because, you know, for, in order for us to make money, you have to eliminate the the problem and we cannot make money if you're gonna have a thousand guys out there running and doing illegal work so if you have to as contractors if, you, if you're gonna raise the fees and raise the fees but can you get the personnel there to help these people because it's not, I, don't, I don't believe it's them I mean two people and you got a thousand contractors out there I mean shoot I got a crew I can't even find all of the guys that you know and imagine just two people uh, two investigators that's right. So, uh, you know, I mean, what, what do you need to do? Increase fees? Then increase the fee. I, have a, I don't have a problem. But all we want is to just get the job done. Perhaps uh, should that be published as well, um, 
publish more out to the public to let them know, do you have a licensed contractor? Hmm. How do you know if you have a licensed contractor? Uh, the publication could assist the public, you know, as to inform them. And, and, and it shows you how to select. We do have a website, how to select. And he is a victim as a licensed contractor, and not only the consumers out there. And this is what we're trying to eliminate, the license activity. That's where the enforcement is to protect the protection of the public, such as Mr. Paris's company. It's saddening to hear that, but it's true, and there's some people that don't want, and that's what we're trying to do, is to inform the public and protect them as well. And, and actually, I can appreciate with what both you gentlemen are saying, and I guess in my mind, it seems that maybe a little more uh, information or publications or, or whatever to go out to educate the consumers about the hazards of hiring a non-licensed uh, contractor could have, you know, and, and again, because not everything can be solved by law. We can pass as many laws as we want, right, and feel that we've done the job, but we see that even now with all the laws we have in our books, there's a lot of loopholes or a lot of people who just don't follow it. Right. Uh, and so maybe it is basically part of that whole education campaign, especially as I think as we move forward and we're going to see a lot more um, work on this island because of you know the factors, whether it's the increase in hotel rooms that we're looking forward to in Tumon, as well as the military buildup and other things, an uh, increase in population, right? I think this is where maybe an informational campaign might be helpful to the, to the businessmen, you know, the contractors, as well as the licensing board. Uh, just a suggestion from what I'm hearing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, on the publications, that's why the investigation supports it, sir, just, you know, is because it's letting the public aware of that. But perhaps we could do advertisement at like the Casa Guam or the GCA, we could publicize that, but we're seeking the funding to do that to help out the public in there. And I believe we've been in discussions too of finding individuals that are unlicensed to publicize the picture and put it at the mayor's office. I don't know, we're just gonna see legal, just to help the people at the communities that go out there and see that, so they won't be victimized. All right, thank, thank you very much. Mr. Perez, before you leave, please make sure that you provide your contact number on that uh, sign up sheet that you signed in on. Okay, uh, Senator Blas, did you have anything? Okay. All right, thank you very much, gentlemen. And uh, Bill 188-33 is uh, duly heard. Um, next on the agenda is <coughs> Bill number 191-33. I have uh, signed up to speak is uh, Mr. Philippe Gerling. Uh, are you giving, uh, yep, just written? Okay. Uh, just providing written testimony, Mr. Jose Garcia, First Hawaiian Bank. Uh, just uh, written testimony, okay. And I have Mr. Phil Flores from Bank Pacific. Uh, are you giving oral testimony? <laughs> For the record, identify yourself, please. Uh, thank you, Senator. I'm Phil Flores. I'm president of Bank Pacific. Before I go further, uh, I'm, I'd like to make an offer to the Guam contractors. If you want to use, if you want to use our LEDs at the bank, we'll get out public announcements for you uh, on using uh, a licensed contractor. Okay. Anyway, um, Chairman Ada, uh, Sponsor McCready, fellow Republic sen fellow senators, senators, just trying to have fun. I'm Philip Flores, President of Bank Pacific, and I come here today to testify in favor of Bill 19133, an amendment to certain subsections of Chapter 12, Title 16, and the Guam uh, Code annotated relative to towing notice requirements. Oh, sorry, Before I'm, I get going, uh, please support, let me start by thank. Yes. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I, I, um, I'm going to ask the sponsor first to introduce oh, the bill. Oh, okay. It's okay? Okay. All right, I'm thank sorry. you. I'm sorry. Proceed. <laughs> I want to start by thanking the members for my recent confirmation to the Guam Board of Medical Examiners. I pleasure to work hard and jilt diligently to, uh, in the new position you have allowed me to fill. With respect to 19133, we are asking that lien holders and insurers be provided notice whenever a vehicle on which a lender has a lien or on which an insurance company has placed insurance is towed and held by one of the respective towing companies in Guam. 
Current law already requires towing companies to inform the lien holder and insurer when a vehicle is towed without the owner's knowledge. We are simply asking that the notice be required in all cases. At Bank Pacific and other banks, we often have liens on a vehicle with what is referred to as a 90-day partial recourse. In such a case, if a bar becomes delinquent, the bank has 90 days to return the vehicle to the dealer, and the dealer would take possession of the car and pay off the borrower's loan. This is a very common practice in the industry. Because of the lack of notice, we have lost our 90 days partial recourse on three occasions. If we had been noticed, this would not have happened. We recently found out another vehicle on which we have a lien has been held since June 29th, 130 days ago by a certain towing company. That's 130 days of storage fees. Further, this vehicle was involved in an accident, and as our understanding, the insurance company also just found out about the vehicle. If we had been notified, we would have had the vehicle removed and brought to the auto dealer which sold it. And also, if the insurance company had been notified, they could have gone into action to repair the vehicle. Further, it is easy for the towing operators to determine who the lien holder and the insurer are. The information is on the front of your auto registration. And as stated earlier, the towing companies are already required to notify the lien holder and insurer when a vehicle is towed without the owner's knowledge. We are just asking that we be notified in all cases. This would be fair to the owner, the bank, and the insurance company. Thank you, and I'm available for questions if you wish. Okay. Senator McCready, did you have any comments to make? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just had a question. I know the other um, stakeholders in this uh, testified in support, but do you, do you guys all as an industry, and, and I guess as a banking industry and a car industry, do you have the same problems? Are you experience, do you guys experience the same problems that he's experiencing? And, and how big is the problem uh, as far as numbers? It, it is a problem. Please step forward. Sorry about that. Good morning, Senators. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jose Garcia. Oh. Good morning, Senators. My name is Jose Garcia from First Wine Bank. And Anyway, uh, yes, we do share the same problems. Our volumes are pretty large. We are a large lender. We we do finance a lot of vehicles. And, um, yeah, the numbers are, are large. And I don't have the specific numbers, but we do have um, – I can get it. But, um, yeah, we do share the same problem. Um, we usually find out too late mm -hmm. uh, whether – you know because we do have a lot of these recourse uh, uh, loans. So when – Mr. Chair, so when you – and the reason why I asked that question is because somebody has to pay for it down the road. Yes. So when the bank when the bank absorbs the cost, the added cost, do they then pass that on to the consumer somehow? Well, I mean, does this cost start to affect the the yes the, immediately the, the credit consumer their, industry. the credit history initially yeah. and then the loss? Yes. Well, so. I'm just I'm just thinking do do does it affect not just the individual who was either negligent or, or smashed the car and got it towed but would this in the long run affect the entire yeah it industry? does have a ripple effect yeah okay it, so that's what from I was the at. consumer's credit initially and then the bank taking a loss the dealer possibly also you know having the cost would go up to recoup yes. that cost yes so in the long run everybody, everybody kind of loses would, yes okay and the problem that we find is yeah these when it's, for example, you gave a very good example of that one being stored for hundreds odd days. We don't know where the vehicle's at. We hear it's there, but we cannot get it. They deny that it's there. Yes. We try to secure it, but that's, we are in favor of it with our written testimony there. We, we, we just want to make the process easier where we're Reven Tax. We to give them the tow companies a little time to where Reven Tax would help get them the information if they can't get it. But like uh, Mr. Flores said, it's all there on the registration. Now we have two, uh, two banking two banks, yes. opinions uh, from the the automobile Ar automobile uh, association. What is what is your um, what do you foresee uh, when when they experience a rippling effect? Do you guys raise prices when when you can't recoup the cost? Uh, Senator McCready, my name is Philip Girling. I'm the vice president of the Guam Dealers Association. Um, well, we're all in business to survive. I mean, yes. we can't just keep absorbing costs. Mm -hmm. um, 
and uh, we, we are affected just as much as the banks because we operate and I don't have account from uh, our individual members uh, mm -hmm. what type of losses or uh, incidents they have encountered but we also operate most of us most of the deals operate rent a car companies um, and we have uh, visitors on island who get into accidents the vehicle get towed and is the same thing it's either on the consumer side or it is on the on the you know the, the rental side but we we all get hit with the same situations um, and the the towing industry is not always uh, very cooperative yes. in uh, uh, besides you producing this legislation but releasing vehicles even when we know where they are and when we're ready to get the cars released so it is it is a challenging situation so the dealerships basically experience the problem through the rent-a-car side of the risk and and sometimes our own vehicles I mean okay. we have customers um, who get into an accident they want their vehicle re repaired they can't get it out of the towing lot because the tow company doesn't want to release it I mean it's it's and they're, they're just basically building up s storage time because that's where they make extra money and normally and uh, normally when you finally recoup the car uh, are you recouping the car to resell it? And and if you are, do you have to do some some maintenance work that might have not been uh, needed before it was either stored or you know? I mean, are the tires there? Are the the radio there? Is everything accounted for when you when you get the car back? Uh, not always, but okay. Yeah, so that, sometimes, that's another. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay. No, I mean it's difficult to judge because right. when the car has been in an accident, um, who knows what happened uh -huh. between the time it was in the accident and got towed to the lot. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, I so you you stated something about, uh, for example, the car owner after he realizes finds out which towing company picked up his car, uh, the the towing company doesn't release the car for whatever reason, to maybe rack up more storage uh, fees. Um, so I guess to my question of, I read in here, we're making a, an amendment to a certain section of the law that would then require that these notices be given, um, I guess, under any circumstance, right? Uh, but I don't, I don't know, maybe it's in another section of the law. So, so what if they don't send the notice, so what? Is there anything in the law that you're aware of? Yeah, I checked with our legal counsel, and they're basically they're subject. It's perjury, I believe, what they violate if they don't comply. So, and if we don't, if we find out they don't comply, we, from what I found, is that we could inform the police or GPD of non-compliance. Okay, so it becomes and that's built in. in so it becomes a criminal room. offense on yeah, their part. Yeah, subject to perjury, I believe. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Senator Spadon, do you have any questions? Senator Blas? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I just need to take a look further at what part of the law, the disincentive part or the punitive part of the law of what happens if they don't send out that notice. I, I mean, obvious, obviously, obviously, whatever, whatever, uh, punitive measure is in the law right now is just probably not sufficient to catch their catch the attention of, of the towing companies. It, it's, am I wrong? Yeah, I'm not trying to impugn the uh, reputation of all the uh, the towing companies, but they are di very very difficult to work with, and. Um, if there is a way to strengthen the punitive uh, uh, measures, I'd certainly appreciate that if it was done. Yeah, yeah, okay. Which really kind of forms the question in my mind, and maybe it shouldn't be directed to you gentlemen, and maybe this is where maybe the author should have been given the chance to, or maybe should have spoken to the bill, because I guess in my mind is, I understand what we're talking about here, but in the bigger picture, I guess the question is, what is the problem? Uh, and, and these gentlemen spoke to it to a degree, but I'm just wondering, does that address, is this bill just to address the concerns that these gentlemen have because there are other sections in the proposed bill that also have, I think I have some questions about. So I'm just trying to understand, is there a problem with the towing companies? And Mr. Flores kind of alluded to the fact that 
he's not trying to impugn anybody's reputation, but it could be difficult working with him. Is that what we're trying to rectify here? Okay, can I add one thing? Oh, yes. go ahead. Oh, sure. Sorry. Please. I, 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 I would quick. just, I believe right now there's like a, the, from my understanding, there's a $300 charge, right, for this, the max that they can, for, for to hold the vehicles. So basically what's happening is you hold the car for 100 odd days, they won't give up the car, even though they're supposed to. It was at the 300 they want to collect, so they refuse to let it go unless you pay the fees for the storage fees that are way in excess of $300. So those are some of the challenges. I'm surprised, I'm surprised that none of the towing companies are here. Um, you know, I, I would think it would be in their interest to be here also. So. Yeah, we tried. We've tried. Um, pursuing legal action and we've had some companies just close a, that company and start up as another company. I mean, there's just, believe me, there's, they know all the tricks of the trade. I mean, so we tried, we, I mean, we tried to go after them legally and we still. So, so the way I read Bill 191 simply says that uh, the towing company has to send this notice to, to the bank. Um, if the car was towed without the owner's consent. So we just kind of, widen the the net right but it still doesn't it, it seems like it doesn't go to the heart of the problem of well why aren't these guys sending it out the and compliance yeah. and it seems that that's where the problem might be i mean otherwise we can you know we can widen the net as wide as we want but if is mr chair if, if i may i think Part of the problem is too, is the fact that the meter keeps running for the towing storage. And so this bill would allow them to have a cap where they, I mean, uh, you guys don't have, that? you. Well, it's the 48 hours would not allow, if you don't, if you don't inform the, the, the banks or the, the, the dealers of within 48 hours, then you would be. We were recommending some milestones and there's some time Table there but for but it doesn't it say shorter. anything about what happens if it, I don't see anything in here about that then if they don't send it out within two days that's it the storage clock turns off within two working days yeah so with it on page two section three or line three they would have to because what what the problem is now is you're getting a bill for nine hundred or a thousand dollars correct and and that bill if it was only two day, two, two working days of storage, would, if you were informed it, of it, be, it would be much lower, much lower. So that's, I mean, so that's, and that's the ripple effect that we talked about earlier. And it's even, like I said in my testimony, it even goes beyond that. That if they don't tell us at all, then we lose our ninety days recourse provision. Okay. So well, that's. I, I understand. Yeah. I understand putting in that that they have to send out this notice within forty eight hours. But it, but then it just stops there, and it doesn't say, and and so if you don't, the storage clock stops at two days. Yes. So it's so it doesn't say that in here. That's what I'm saying. Okay. You know, we I mean, can. I mean, we kind of like yeah. you have to jump through this hoop, and and if you don't, so what? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't say it. Well, I, I guess the part that uh, Mr. Flores just alluded to being that the working environment is not maybe uh, satisfying it would allow us to then put a little more. Yeah, you, uh, light actually in the you're bill. right because they, if they don't tell us, they still get to keep it, uh, they still get to build up as much as a month, uh, 30 days at $10 a day of, uh, of uh, fees. And they hold the car hostage. No, I, I understand that. No, so, no, I'm agreeing with you if you want to shut no and tighten it up. there's no disincentive being yeah. put in here that if you don't, if you don't jump I, through this hoop. I agree, I agree with the chairman. What happens. Yeah. I agree. I just didn't know the contention of the, the relationship between the two was that, you know, was, wasn't was so balanced. So Senator Adler, we, we offered to add to it and work with you if we needed to add further to it, more beef like that. We I, And I, I really think, you know, this thing really merits, merits or warrants a roundtable discussion because I really want to, I really would like to get the, the towing companies in to find out What's the problem, guys? And and you know if if 
Yeah, I, I think the other the other player needs the other stakeholder needs to be involved in the oh, discussion. Senator, then you'll have a fun time to see all the charges that they they bill somebody. Someone's in an accident; they're stressed out, they're freaked out. They, you know, we don't get into accidents every day. My car is damaged. Maybe somebody's injured. So you're going to be charged for the towing. You're going to be charged for the cleanup. You're going to be charged for the dolly. You're going to be charged for the extra person. I mean, there's there are a ton of charges that they add on. And so if you have that round table, you'll discover a, a lot of things. Okay. But we just want to get the car out of the lot. Sooner. <laughs> no, I understand. And, and, and the bill says, let us know within 48 hours, but it still doesn't answer the question of, and if they don't, then what? Uh, uh, it, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I, 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 Again, not to take away from anything, because I have a total agreement that I think this needs to go further in terms of just understanding what really is going on with the industry. But going back to this bill, and you gentlemen are familiar with it now, the change on page two to the existing law basically just says uh, uh, within two working days. The, uh, the only addition was the word working. A previous law, it said two days. It was that just to, and again, maybe it's a question to the author, but so far we've been talking about 48 hours. But when we start talking two working days, that not ne is not necessarily 48 hours. It, uh, it could be, Senator, but the towing companies, you see them prowling around on Saturdays and Sundays. Right. Yeah. But, I mean, I would, it would seem to me that 48 hours would be more appropriate for your purposes as opposed to two working days. Because if they tow somebody on a Saturday, right, and they had two working days, they wouldn't really have to report it to you technically until probably Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay, good point. Right, whereas if it was 48 hours, if they towed it on Saturday, by Monday, you should have that notice. So I'm just wondering, you know, you, you spoke in favor of this bill, and I'm just wondering if you made that distinction. I didn't. <laughs> you caught something I didn't. Okay. I, and, and again, I, I'm trying to understand your position, and I think I, I do, right? But again, the, I think the key is to shorten that amount of time, right? And this may not necessarily do it by including the, the word working. In it, fact, if we were to change that, if we were to change that, that within 48 hours, so if they picked it up Friday night, you know, they, well, then the problem with that is that if you have to send it out certified mail, post office is not open on it. On, so, okay. I mean, that's, that's it's a real something fine point, but it's a, it's but a loophole that, you know. We'd have to try to close. Yeah. I mean, okay. So, I mean, I, I understand, I understand where you guys are coming from. I think there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the bill. Uh, for me, it's kind of, you know, we've said, okay, here's the hoop that you need to jump through, but it doesn't answer the question of what if he doesn't chooses not to jump through it, other than, other than that penalty of perjury, because then now it becomes, uh, now it becomes a criminal action, and uh, then I guess you guys have to file charges, uh, and you know what happens well, when it goes over across the street take your number in line and that could be a long wait for you guys so okay yeah if we can tighten up even more that's all the better I, i'm i'm like for we're like first wine a bank we've we have had to have our attorneys call the towing companies to say I'm, we're going to sue you if you don't release the car yeah so if, if we can put some punitive damage in there i'd be fine sure from our point of view yeah i'm sure the author will work on that right Thank yeah you. That's right. Sorry, I'll get um, I'll get with you guys and I'll I'll send the chair. Okay, uh, thank the, you. The amendments and of course uh, we don't want it to distract from the other bills <laughs> that you put in. <laughs> and and we'll uh, we'll you know if you, like you said you're kind of behind the eight ball. You want this you want this done yesterday. Uh, so if the chair holds a round table, you know of course we'll all be notified and um, but I will send him the amendments. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All thank right, you. That, thank you very much, gentlemen. And with that, then. Uh, We'll consider Bill 191-33 uh, having been duly heard. And the Committee on um, Transportation, Lands, Infrastructure, Water Protection, Veterans Affairs, and Procurement 
We'll go into recess until 1.30 this afternoon for an oversight hearing. Thank you.